in it. It would be a good refresher, maybe if you've been following the Lord for a while. And again, if you are starting a new relationship with Jesus, we want you to participate with that. Well, obviously, Galatians chapter 5 comes before Galatians chapter 6. I think that's how numbers go. I'm not very good with numbers, but I'm pretty sure that's how it works. And last week, uh, Pastor Mel um, shared out of Galatians chapter 5, and if you are following along uh, with your notes, or maybe you kept notes from last week, I want you to flip back to those just for a second, uh, because we're going to look at that as we set up today. There's a few overarching themes in the book of Galatians, and uh, those are, are centered around this idea that the law of Moses the thou shalt not, okay, the law of Moses um, in and of itself is not a bad thing, but it is unable to set us free from sin. The law that brought us condemnation or cursed us, we can only find freedom from that through Christ, not from fulfilling the law. Now, again, in ancient time, the Mosaic Law was not just the Ten Commandments. I bet you guys can name the Ten Commandments. If I asked you to do that, maybe we would work together with our neighbor. We could at least get five each, right? My boys know the Ten Commandments. But the Mosaic Law was actually 613 phrases starting, thou shalt not or thou shall. Now, the whole essence of the law that God gave to us was so that we could live a life pleasing to him, but also to expose, as Paul tells us, that we can't get to God just by following law, okay? Laws are good things. Speed limits are good. They keep us safe, um, even if some people don't keep them very well. I know some of you have a hard time with that. Me too. Um, <laughs> but the essence of the law, though, the problem with the law is that if you break one of those 613 laws, you've lost it. You've lost them all. You've broken all of it and severed relationship or the opportunity for relationship with God. You are defiled. But Paul tells us in Romans that Christ came and fulfilled the law. He didn't cancel it. The law is very important. God gave it. God said it, so it's important. But Christ came to fulfill the law. You see, there was a debt to be paid for us because of the curse of our inability to keep the law. It taught us that we in and of ourselves can't keep ourselves righteous or holy before God. But Christ came, he lived a spotless life, and I tell you, he paid the price with his blood to make you right with God. That's phenomenal. That is the very essence, the gospel. That is the Jesus that we center our lives around. Let's look at Galatians chapter 5. Just for the sake of context, uh, we're looking at two different areas that we can focus our lives around. Uh, one is pretty nasty, and uh, it really does yield some pretty nasty results. And the other one, Paul encourages us to go all into. Let's look at the first one. At verse 19 of Galatians chapter 5, it says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissension, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. That sounds like a terrible neighbor to live next door, doesn't it? Nobody wants to move, nobody wants to buy a house next to a neighbor that, that produces that kind of fruit, right? Nobody wants to, uh, when their family is memorializing them in a service after they've gone to be with the Lord, nobody wants these things, any of these things to be mentioned uh, when they're talking about your life, right? Nobody. I don't. We don't want to be remembered for these things. We ultimately don't want to produce these things in our life. But Paul says if we don't focus on what is right, these things will persist in our life. It is our fallen nature, our unnatural tendency because of sin to focus on the flesh, and this is what we produce. But Paul gives us encouragement. He says if we focus on these other things, then we'll bear better fruit. Verse 22 says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, Patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against these things, there are no law. Paul told us that if we'd focus on what is right, then we would be free from the law. And the reason that is, is when we focus on the Spirit, we produce these things that against them there is no law. Patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness. Are you going to get pulled over by a Pennsylvania trooper? No. You won't, because you won't be breaking a law. You see, it is because of what Christ has done in us that our lives produce these things, but it does take a focus for these things to develop. Today we're going to continue in Galatians chapter 6, but let's first say a quick prayer. 
Father, thank you for your faithfulness. God, I thank you for the opportunity today to teach your word. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would have his way in this place, would move on our hearts according to your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take a look at the first verse in Galatians. I did mention before that we have growth track. And the first week is about what, who the church is and our history and that kind of thing. And in the process, in that th- three-week process, we begin to ask, what is your summit story? And that is the best part about teaching growth track for me, is getting to know everyone's individual summit story. Um, my wife, Alicia, and I um, just recently moved to western Pennsylvania in January. We came all the way up from the great state of Texas, which we are both very proud to be from. But we never knew that we could move somewhere where people were more proud and had more state proud than even folks in Texas. Welcome to western Pennsylvania. You guys are very proud and kind people. We love western Pennsylvania already. And uh, our boys, we have three boys. Alicia and I have been married since 2009, and we have three beautiful uh, boys, and uh, they are fantastic. Um, our baby just turned five last week, so that's like, like my heart is dying inside, but it's kind of cool. And uh, Nathaniel is eight, Levi is seven, and Luke is five. And when we decided that the Lord was speaking to us, Alicia and I, as we prayed, and we were sensing that a season of ministry was coming to a close where we were, and it was a great situation, a great place. We were very loved, and, and similar to you guys being so generous and, and fantastic, you guys have already invited us into the Summit family, and we thank you for that. We had a church family there. We had a real blood family there, and uh, when the Lord started working on our hearts, we felt moved to speak to our kids about it. Now, if you're a parent, major life decisions, you don't come to your kid asking for advice. Usually you lead them, right? Even if you ask questions, it's leading. You know the answer to like a good lawyer. Um, But, uh, hey, that's true. Um, (laughs) Our boys uh, were devastated when we said, hey, guys, uh, we want to let you know that God is working in us and we're not quite sure yet what's going to take place but it may require us to move and they have little friends and they have plans for this and they have plans for this school year and they love their teachers and they love the people at the church but there was a teaching moment there and as a parent I would encourage you don't look past that teaching moment look for every opportunity because we actually got to teach them about listening to the spirit of God and we said listen if if God's calling us to this he'll make it clear He'll make it right and he'll provide all the way. That was the beginning of a great opportunity uh, to lead them as we felt the call of God to come here and join Summit. Again, we have some history with Pastor Mel and Pastor Kim, and uh, they're phenomenal people. We've known them for about 15 years, but our boys didn't know them before this. And I tell you, they've made a full turnaround, but those conversations are still consistent in our home once or twice a week. Dad, Uh, We miss grandma, we miss grandpa, we miss this person or that person. And we always close it with, obviously there's some tears and some love and that kind of encouragement, maybe phone calls. But it's, hey, but remember what we said. If God's going to set us up, he's going to give us everything we need and he's going to be with us the whole way. That's Paul's desire as we close up Galatians. Let the spirit lead you, let it produce fruit in you, and you will see that God will provide every step of the way. Galatians chapter 6, here we go. It says, Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. Share each other's burdens, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? It's to love God and to love your neighbor. That makes it a whole lot simpler than the 613 laws of Moses. I'm going to give you guys four points today as we look at Galatians chapter 6. And if you are taking notes, the first point is people of the Spirit are accountable. Now, accountability is a loaded word. In our day and age, people don't like accountability. It means that we're going to have a tough conversation and someone is going to be blamed for something or someone did something wrong. Let's look at the context here first, though. Because Paul doesn't call us fools like he did in chapter 3. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate it. He's going to get us in a minute, though, so don't worry. He calls us dear brothers and sisters. The tone from which accountability comes from in this passage 
is one of kindness and gentleness. It's one that resembles what Christ came to do. Christ came to give life and life abundantly. He came to restore, not to destroy. So accountability that we have with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Again, Paul is speaking to believers in the early church, his brothers and sisters in Christ. When we hold our brothers and sisters in Christ accountable, it is to bring them back to fellowship with the Lord, to bring them back into right standing and gentleness and kindness. Gentleness is a fruit of the Spirit that we see here. It also encourages us to show self-control. Maybe there's a brother or sister in Christ that has hurt you or someone that, someone that has just really offended you by their actions or embarrassed you. Listen, as we approach a brother or sister in Christ, there's a biblical way to do that. But when we hold them to accountability, we have to show self-control. Again, self-control, not to lose it, not to show anger and strife and division because that is produced out of the flesh, but also not to fall into the same temptation. It's hard to correct somebody for something that you do yourself. That's hard to do. But because we have the Spirit in us and because we invest in spiritual things, gentleness and self-control will be produced in our own life. Let's continue into verse 3. If you think you are too important, here he comes, to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You are not that important. Here you go. That's Paul. That's the Paul I know. Pay careful attention to your own work, for then you will get the satisfaction of a job well done, and you won't need to compare yourself to anyone else, for we are each responsible for our own conduct. All right. People of the Spirit are humble. I thought the first one, the first point was going to be hard. But this one may be even more of a challenge for us. Being humble. Uh, Our oldest boy, Nate, loves football. And in fact, um, he has asked us every day uh, since he's been old enough to play football that he wants to play football. I want to play football. He loves to watch the NFL even more than I do, which is kind of strange. Because I I do. We follow a team. We have a home team at our house. And they have shirts and Um, We have hats and we have things that we wear when we watch that team. It is not the Dallas Cowboys. Don't worry. (laughs) It's not the Houston Texans, but they're insignificant. So, um, but uh, when we moved up here, we knew that we wanted to watch the Super Bowl. We knew that we were hoping our team, our home team, the family team, I'm still contending it's our family team, um, that they were going to make it well into the playoffs. And we were watching... On a Saturday, I believe, and we, uh, we were watching a game here, or was it a Friday? I don't know, whatever it was. And Nate was sitting with me, and we watched our home team win, and they won very well. Um, unfortunately, their big-time quarterback um, after the season retired, so we're going to have a problem there. But then we stayed up to watch the Steelers play, okay? And my boys, I don't get it. They really heard the other people in Texas who were Steelers fans that were like, oh, here, have a Steelers jersey. Here, have some Steelers gear. And I'm like, ooh. I can't wear that in public, you know. I can't hear, I guess. Um, but they got, they got through to my boys. And Nate is a diehard Steelers fan. I don't know where it came from. Yeah, there you go. Woo-woo, right? And, <laughs> and uh, he's got a little Palomalu jersey and, you know, whatever. And I'm like, hey, he's a great. Yeah, hey, yeah, there you go. <laughs> we're doing it right, okay. If we're going to do something, we're going to go all in. And uh, so Nate stayed up late. We're still getting used to East Coast time, we're still getting used to the time change, and, and uh, <clears throat> that game that won't be spoken about after today was, let's just say, say kindly, it was a disappointment. When the Steelers came out to play, that team from wherever, with that quarterback from wherever, um, we, we were devastated. And Nate, who stayed up late, he's past his bedtime, he cried the entire second quarter and was furious, not crying like sad. He was angry. <laughs> wow, what happened to this kid? He's in his jersey throwing something. And, and, of course, we corrected him for that. And he put himself to bed before halftime. He said, I'm going to bed. <laughs> He's a diehard Steelers fan. What can I say? He belongs here. Um, but, hey, we can be Steelers and Saints fans in the same house. It's okay. Snuck that in there. Just say amen. Okay. Now, the Steelers have had a phenomenal history of absolutely fantastic coaches. And their current coach, Mike Tomlin, is a phenomenal example of that. 
I, I know Tomlin came into his role there and immediately showed results. Um, he was one of the youngest, at that time, the youngest coach to win a Super Bowl. He was also the quickest coach to, um, uh, to get his team to the Super Bowl as far as tenure being at a team, which is pretty phenomenal. Um, but one of the things I like most about Mike Tomlin is he's different in his approach in coaching his NFL teams. He takes more of a psychological approach. He reads Robert Frost poems to his teams, apparently, um, and he, he tries to get them in the right headspace first before it's about production. And um, anybody know Ben Roethlisberger? Anybody know? If you know him, give me his cell phone. I want to meet up with him. Um, but Ben Roethlisberger was the, the quarterback for the Steelers. He's been there a long time. Uh, he's a big deal. They've stuck that franchise tag on him. He's staying around. Um, it came out in one of the interviews that he did recently about this mantra, uh, if you will, that um, Coach Tomlin tells all the players. He said it pretty much invades your life even when you're doing your own private stuff in the off season. If you're in the weight room by yourself, if you're with the team, if you're uh, welcoming rookies, this is the mantra that is playing all the time in the back of your head. And he, say it, he says, I say it all the time, it just comes out. And this is it. More grounded, more humble, more selfless makes us more opportunistic. Let me say that one more time. More grounded, more humble, more selfless makes us more opportunistic. Now, this does not hold as much authority as the word of God. But as Paul is encouraging us to be humble, uh, let's think of it as a team real quick. You see, each one of us has a part to play in the kingdom of God. But the kingdom of God is not revolving around you. You are not the lead singer in the band. You are not the person up front. You are not the one leading the parade. Because the the kingdom of God is not centered around you. It's centered around God. It's his kingdom, not ours. And it is part of our flesh to think that we have earned something in and of ourselves, or that God is going to give us a platform or put us in front of lights or have us speak in front of hundreds of people just for the sake of glorifying us. You see, our job as we are transformed is to be a reflection of Christ and to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. You see, this passage about being humble and taking care of our own work, we each have a job to do just like a football team. We all train, we train privately. I hope that you read the word of God at home by yourself. If you don't like reading, listen to it. It's a really effective tool. I use it every day. Listen, if you are not investing in your own spiritual life, you are missing something. It's like taking an entire off season off. What will you produce? Nothing. You see, in this area, uh, Paul is talking about the spiritual fruit of love. Philippians 2, it defines it as this, and there's some context here, so let me read it. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one Mind, here we go, verse 3, do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Listen, guys, even Christ served people. Even he laid down his life and ultimately gave his life for someone else. We are living in someone else's example, not his, if we put ourselves above someone else. You are not team. The team is the team. Each person making up that team is important. Now, I know this might uh, rub some people the wrong way. The second portion tells us that we must pay attention to our own work, that we're accountable for our own work. Listen, do not look for someone else to affirm you in what God is calling you to do. There is one person that called you and one person that can affirm you. There is one person that can take a true, uh, honest look at your life and what it produces, and that's God. The Holy Spirit can convict your heart in ways that no man can, but can also encourage your heart and affirm your life unlike anyone else. You see, God is the one that we should look to for approval. It says, so you won't have to compare yourself to anyone else. We don't need to do that, church. Don't compare yourself to me, because there are things in your life that I probably would love to do better. But we are on the same team. That doesn't mean we have to be the same person. We don't have to be the same person. Um, Linked along on this road is this journey is following Christ. Listen, there is power in having a fresh new believer that's new to their walk with Christ come alongside someone that's been at it for 50 years. You see fruit from that. That's team. It is in relationship with one another that the reflection of Christ is shown to the world. Let's look at verse um, 6. 
So people of the Spirit are humble, and here comes verse 6. Those who are taught the word of God should provide for their teachers, sharing all good things with them. People of the Spirit are generous. Now, I want to say this. I want to speak on behalf of our pastoral staff here at Summit. Thank you so much for your generosity celebrating Pastor's Appreciation this month. It means a lot to us. I know Alicia and I have only been laboring here a short time, but our staff greatly appreciates your cards that share, share personal stories about what God is doing in your family and, and what's happening in your kid's life. Listen, we love that and we cherish that so much. I know that when I get a card like that, I keep it in a file in my office for that tough day because they will come. And I like to come back and say, look, God, I'm doing something. And it encourages me. Thank you so much for being an encouragement to us. Generosity, Pastor Christina did a great job talking about this just a moment ago. When you're generous, it enables amazing things to take place in the kingdom of God. It is unfortunate that often our fleshly desire is to believe that whatever we earn is ours. But the real truth is, everything you get in life is a gift. Even that next breath that you breathe, even if it's a yawn, that's okay. God gave it to you, so just embrace it. Just don't cover it up, it's okay. Everything that you receive, your beautiful family, your wonderful job, that paycheck every Friday, I want to encourage you, you didn't earn it. It's a blessing. Ask someone who doesn't have a beautiful family. Ask someone who doesn't have a wonderful job and a paycheck on Friday. It's a gift. We need to treat it that way. It is our flesh desire to hold on to something. But Paul is telling us to partner and share all good things with those who share the gospel, who are investing in our spiritual lives and in our spiritual lineage. Think for just a moment today, right now, who's investing in your spiritual lineage? Now, not me. Let's think of someone else. Who's teaching your kid and some of kids right now? Do you know who that is? Have you met that worker, that dream team member? Who's prepared for them all week? Who makes sure that the facilities are right and sanitized and ready for them? They've got all the supplies that they need. Listen, that person is investing in your spiritual lineage. Why? Because that child will carry on what you teach them and what they teach them spiritually. They are investing in your spiritual life. Share all good things with those. What about our U groups? What about our United College Ministry? Who's teaching your, your young adult or who's teaching you right now as a young adult in your U group? That person is investing in you spiritually. There are so many different people away from this platform that spend time during the week to make sure that this goes well, that we can disciple you. They're writing curriculum for a starting point. They're leading growth track. They're, they're making sure everything is right online so everybody that is watching online, who we love dearly, by the way, can see what you see in person and can be a part of this fellowship. Again, appreciate those people. Let them know. But also a second portion of this language of sharing means to carry a burden with. So not only just tell people, hey, you're doing a great job greeting this Sunday. How about you join them in doing what they're doing? Why don't you consider and ask the Holy Spirit to lead you, hey, how can I partner with the ministry partners here at Summit? If they've blessed you, that means there's a great opportunity that if you join them, you could bless someone else too. Here at Summit, our goal is not that you check all the boxes and get a membership card. No, we believe that when Christ is introduced into your life, that every life can be made different. And what that looks like is not a list of thou shalt and thou shalt not, but it looks like a transformed life. Paul says that's the ultimate goal. We want you to find a way to engage in what the kingdom of God is doing first in you. Get into a discipleship group. Get into a, a connection group. Hear the word of God. Let it be taught more than just on Sunday. But then also serve. Let the Lord speak to you and begin to work the work that he's calling you to do. Wherever that is, we want you to engage in the ministry of God. Verse 7. Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. Hmm, that's so good. Going back to my previous point just for a minute about people of the Spirit being generous. If you're looking to plant something, you have to have something to plant. If you want to harvest, you have to plant, and if you have to plant, you have to have a store to plant. 
But if we are constantly consuming all that we have, we find ourselves not having seed when we want to sow. Now, I want to be gentle and kind about this, but if you don't have margin worked into every aspect of your life, you are not holding aside seed to sow into the kingdom of God. Yes, I am talking financially. My family, um, we believe in living on a budget, okay? That doesn't mean we can't do things. That means we can do things that we think are more important than other stuff that comes along. Now, yes, financially, we would encourage you to have margin in your life so that when it's time and the Spirit tells you to and you feel led to plant seed into something, you can do it. That's important. But also, how about your time? If I asked you to raise your hand today, I bet you most of the room would say, I'm really busy. Well, you're always going to be busy unless you make margin in your life. You see, your time is valuable. Time is more valuable than money because you never can earn any more time. In fact, you don't know what the the balance is for your time until it's over. But you can never earn it back. Your time is so critical to the kingdom of God. Are you holding enough side? Are you, are you keeping some seed to sow into what God is calling you to do? Are you sowing, are you, are you keeping enough seed aside so that you can sow into the kingdom of God? Our boys, again, they teach us lessons like crazy. And I'm glad they're not in the room because I would embarrass them with this story. But um, Levi, our seven-year-old, um, we, all three of them just got little um, Velcro wallets, right? And that is a big deal for a little boy, Okay. <laughs> They got Star Wars, and they got Jurassic Park, and Batman, and I didn't get one. Can we, can we, Father's Day's coming up, yes, all right, nothing leather, nothing plain, even if it's Velcro, I want people to know that I'm out to pay, you know, all right, um, next time I'm up here, you'll see a chain and a Batman hanging down. Levi was so excited, because as soon as he got his wallet, that means he can start earning some money. He's seven. And so he barrages me every morning, every night. Dad, can I, can I go do this for a quarter? Can I go do this for a quarter? Can I do this? Man, he's going to hustle in this world. He's going to make it, y'all. He's gonna ma- I'm going to be borrowing money from him. Um, and then so he got some money aside. This was a few weeks ago. And he started collecting some money. And we had some money left over from uh, birthdays or Valentine's, different stuff like that the family had sent. So he had a little bit stored up. But I tell you what, for the last two and a half weeks, It's been like Scrooge McDuck with Levi. (laughs) Every night after we clear the table from dinner, we go into the den and we relax. And he's out there emptying out his wallet, all the change, and puts out all the money. He's like, Dad, come help me count this. And I'm like, dude, we counted it last night and the night before. Stop flexing on me. You got $17.32, and I don't. Okay? (laughs) Like, who carries cash, right? Um. We've talked to them about budgets, and we've talked to them about, you know, our family budget and stuff. But he just, it's like he just loves to count his money. And he's stacking them up, and it's just a mess, and, you know, we got to clean it up. And this past weekend, um, this past week, um, Luke uh, turned five. Uh, Actually, it was a week ago Wednesday, right? And uh, so we planned a trip last weekend to go to Pittsburgh, just me and the boys, and by that, I mean me and three little guys, not the boys, okay? And uh, we were prepping them for it. And, of course, Levi's counting his money every night. And we said, okay, boys, look, you know, this is our budget, and this is what we budgeted for, you know, and we're going to be able to do this and this and this, and we're going to do something great, but we're not going to ask for a bunch of extra things and, you know, whatever. It's for Luke's birthday. And Luke knew. He was very excited. For a five-year-old, he went around the entire weekend telling people, I'm five, you know, and uh, a couple days before we left for the trip, Levi said, hey, Dad, hey, Dad, come here. And I said, what's up? He said, he had already counted his money for the night, by the way. And he said, Dad, don't forget my wallet when we go on our trip. Because I told him I was going to pack and pick him up from school. I said, oh, okay, you want to get something good for the trip? You, you want to get some junk food for guy time, you know? Or, or do you want to, you know, buy a stuffed animal at the History Museum or something like that? He said, well, um, no, Dad, um, we need to make sure that we get Luke a really good birthday present. And I was totally caught off guard. I was thinking, okay, we're going to have to talk about how money's not a bad thing, but the love of money's a bad thing. And here he is teaching me something about generosity. The truth here is, and Paul tells us this, if you plant nothing, you get nothing. If you plant garbage, one day you're going to dig in that dirt and there's just going to still be garbage there. 
But if you plant good seed, if you're willing to give your precious time, see, if you plant something good, then you'll get something good. Levi knew that. Nate told me the same thing. He's a little older and he was a little more practical about it. He was like, Dad, we just don't want him crying, so we got to get him something good and, you know, whatever. <laughs> the, the, the oldest brother. But listen, if you don't have anything to plant, then you don't get to join in the harvest. See, I softened you up right there, but it's true. Don't be misled. People of the Spirit spread hope. That's our last point today. People of the Spirit spread hope. Jesus, as he was encouraging his, uh, his disciples to go out on their little mini missions trips, he was getting ready two by two, and he said, listen, pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send out workers. That's in, in Matthew chapter 9. And what he was saying was, listen, there is such a great harvest waiting, but the workers are few. There is such a good thing coming. There is such fruit that is going to come out of your efforts, out of you allowing God to use you. But we need workers for that harvest. People of the Spirit spread hope. Verse 9 says this, let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. Let's define harvest real quick. Ultimately, the goal that God has for all of mankind, for this entire world, is that we would come together as his body because of his son's blood, and we would come and bring back his children. We were all prodigals once. Okay, there's a story of a son that left home and, and basically decided he's going to do his own thing. I've been there. And then he realized what he did was wrong. He found that he was, he was making unwise decisions and found that he had nothing in and of his own efforts. Listen, there are people all over this world that feel that way. No matter what religious practices they found, no matter what wealth they found, no matter where they live, they're living in the most beautiful paradise ever, yet there is something that grieves their spirit. God wants to bring them back to him. Because the real truth is, like I said, every single person is equally loved by God. No one is more important. But also, every single person was knit together in their mother's womb, Scripture says. Was put together with a purpose, crafted together by the hand of God. And that purpose was to know him and to make him known. Listen, church, we are brothers and sisters in Christ, and that is your purpose too. The harvest now, Paul is specifically speaking here to those that are inside that relationship with God. And what he's reminding us is what harvest will come from our lives. We've got the big harvest in mind. And instead of a bunch of do's and don'ts, check this box, check that box. He's saying we want your life to produce love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. You see, these things are what trans will produce when your life is transformed by spending time in the spirit, but it will also draw other people to God. I have another question for you. When you plant seed, right, we are to spread hope, plant seed. What is your expectation? You see, because there are different kind of crops, there's different kind of harvest, there's a quick harvest that takes place, right? Um, one of the things up here in western Pennsylvania um, that I, I wasn't aware of was that you guys allow these little white puff balls to sit in your yard unmolested for like however long until you just mow them over. See, down south, we take those bad boys and pull them up by the root because they don't belong. You guys' grass grows just fine here, but in Texas, that's an issue, okay? My boys have planted dozens and dozens, if not billions and whatever, of those little things because they pop them up before I can get out there and pull them, and they... Right? I just want to catch them one time where they're inhaling and just. <laughs> You've seen it. You've seen it. Maybe they'll stop. Um, but sometimes it's easy to plant. And you know, dandelion, um, when you plant them, it's about an eight week turnaround. That's it. And you can produce a new plant with new buds, and it'll actually seed. Eight weeks. Um, Check my facts on it, okay? I Googled it. And there's way more information about dandelions than I ever thought there possibly needed to be. But there are quick harvests in life. 
when you plant seed, when you welcome someone in church, maybe they'll feel comfortable and, and maybe they'll receive Christ. That is fantastic. That's exactly what we want to do. We want to introduce people to Christ. Maybe you're kind to someone at work or um, out in, in our community here or maybe your neighbor and it sparks a spiritual conversation. You know what? That's early fruit. That's great. Maybe you can remember when your life was transformed by this realization that you needed to surrender your life to Christ and you began to feel like there was a weight lifted off your life. You, just, you were forgiven. The shame was gone. The guilt was gone of the life that you dedicated to your flesh before. That's early fruit. That's great. That's good. But what about legacy fruit? What about big things in the kingdom of God? You see, some things take time. If you've ever grown an orchard, we're looking forward to harvest time here in Pennsylvania. And we're going to eat as many apples and go pick as much fruit and everything we possibly can. Um, we're going to make the boys do all the work. But we're really looking forward to it. But did you know if you plant a fruit tree, you've got to expect that it will take three to five years to produce fruit? Don't grow tired of doing good. Don't stop casting your seed out. Don't, don't stop reflecting Christ because you're not seeing fruit yet. Anytime somebody decides they're going to plant an orchard, they plant it first before anything else because they know it's going to take time. And dandelions don't taste very good, but I know a crisp Granny Smith apple is I'm all about it. That's something that can sustain you, okay? It's something that will last. We need to look at the long game and appreciate the short game, but stop, never stop uh, working towards the harvest Verse 11, Paul's kind of starting to come to a close here. It says, um, see with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. You see, there were these uh, Jewish religious type that came alongside to the early church that Paul had planted and was discipling. And they said, hey, listen, we're going we're gonna to teach you how to be uh, godly. We're going to teach you how to look the right way, talk the right way. Oh, and by the way, there's 613 rules we need you to follow, one of which is circumcision. It was a physical outward sign for men. I don't know how they checked it, like a membership card. I'm not sure. Don't want to think about it. Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> but they wanted you to look the part. But Paul's telling them to... Not just look like a Christ follower, but focused on being a Christ follower. These guys said they wanted you to look a certain way so that they could, uh, they could keep themselves away from being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Paul is clearly warning us against just living a religious lifestyle. Verse 13, for even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that you may boast, or so that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. These guys got credit, they thought, in heaven for how many people they got to follow religious law. You know, it's like they, they kept a notch on their belt for everybody they got to follow this law. And Paul says, listen, it's not about that at all. Because as we mentioned just a few weeks ago in Galatians chapter 3, we try to earn this gift of grace and forgiveness from God, and it cheapens what Christ did for us. We should never do that. We should never do that. We can't earn it. That's what these guys were trying to do. But Paul, again, in Paul fashion says, don't worry so much about what people see. Know your motives and stick to what God has called you to do and make sure that you're working towards the spirit and not the flesh and what will be produced in you will be genuine and of God. Verse 15, for neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. Listen, we're talking about lasting fruit here. We're not talking about one experience. I hope that everybody that um, attends either in Blairsville or here in Indiana or joins us online has a great weekend experience at Summit. But that is not our, our end desire. That is not truly what we want for you. What we want is for there to be evidence in your life that you are a new creation, transformed and continuing to be transformed into the likeness of Jesus. So how do we live as people of the Spirit? Now, remember this entire book, Paul says, you know, of what, how dangerous it is to seek righteousness by law outside of relationship with Jesus. We should pursue relationship with him. 
And before I talk about how the Spirit leads us, it's kind of hard to receive the Spirit of God if you haven't received His Son. Jesus set a precedent when He was sharing with His disciples before He ascended back up into heaven after He was resurrected. There is a process here. And that process is this. Jesus said, I came that I could give you life. He said, but I must go because it's better for you that I go so that you can receive the Spirit. First Jesus, then the Spirit of God who sustains us and gives us the strength to do what we're called to do. He will lead us and guide us. But first, as Mike Tomlin would say to his Steelers uh, after a championship, I can't go up there and ask them for a ring, by the way, because I wasn't on the team. He would say, I'm sorry, only people on the team get a ring. Listen, when you receive Christ, you receive a deposit of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God inside of you. It's not like a felt board Jesus like little kids, like when we were little um, who comes and like lodges himself in your aorta, that's not a thing. But maybe today you say, hey, my life is not producing that kind of fruit that I want. But I think I want to be led by the Spirit. First, enter in through the door. Jesus said, I am the door. He is the way to a new life that is truly transformed and yields good fruit. I would encourage you also um, to gain uh, a relationship and community here at Summit. So first receive Christ to be led by the Spirit, and then enter into community, growth track, small groups, serve teams. Come up here and be a part of one of the things that we do here. That will encourage you along your way in your journey with Christ. Community is super important. Accountability is best in relationship and community. Listen, there will be nothing uh, better to humble you than to serve alongside such humble and servant-minded people that we have here in our dream teams here at Summit. I would encourage you again. I said growth track, small groups. Listen, connect in community, be humble, practice generosity, and spread hope. That's it. That's what Paul's desire. And these are not things to check off. But the end goal for these is that you would produce genuine fruit from the Spirit of God working in your life. Uh, at this point in time, I'd like to hand it over to our host in Blairsville. Um, we love you more than you know. We're so proud to be your pastors. God bless you. Now, as we close out today, um, I want to take just a few moments. There were a couple action points there that I want to hit on um, with you guys as you leave this place. We truly believe here at Summit that when somebody comes to know the Lord and Jesus becomes the center of their life, then their life will truly and genuinely be made different. And I mean that in the best way possible. No matter your past, no matter you, what, who you were or what you've done in the past, you have always been God's, whether you knew it or not. Some it's a place where, I, and I, I say this freely, I would say this in front of Pastor Mel if he was here because I know he believes it. Here at Summit, you don't have to behave to belong. Let me be clear. I'm not going to do a background check on you when you come in the door between that front door and the seat you're sitting in. And if you're watching online today, I mean that truly for you too. You don't have to behave to belong. You don't have to have a long standing track record of doing great things. Because I don't. Even if I did, it wouldn't mean anything without Christ. So first thing first, if you felt something inside of you or you felt a draw or something bringing you to a realization that, hey, I think I want to be a part of the family of Christ. Listen, you belong here. You belong in relationship with God. He knit you together in your mother's womb. Yes, Christian, unchristian, whatever. Not just to be religious, but to have a relationship with him. That's the most important thing. I want to give you an opportunity in a minute to receive him and, and accept him. And then secondly, if you've already made that decision to accept Christ and make him the Lord of your life, um, but today and throughout this book of Galatians, we've been talking about being led by the Spirit. You say, I, I, think, I'd, I think I'd be more interested in, in letting the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, lead me. You know, Jesus said we need him. That's why Jesus left. He said, it's better for you that I leave so that he can come. He can lead you in a way that will produce these fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, all these things that we really want our lives to look like, ultimately. 
Maybe today you say, hey, I think I need to, I think I need to make a commitment. And I think, I think I want the Holy Spirit to lead me today. I want you to receive that today. Would you bow your heads with me? Today, if you say, hey, I, I'd like to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I know that I've done some things in my past, but I think I want to be made right with God. I want to be forgiven for what I've done. And I want to live a different life. Today, you can. Today, um, we want to pray with you and we want to come alongside you in agreement. And so I'd ask today, if you want to accept Christ into your life, if you want to put him first in the middle of your life, and you want to allow him in to cleanse you of your past, to forgive you of your sins, and to lead you in the path that you were always destined to be in. If today you want to receive Christ into your life, would you raise your hand real quick and look up at me? Yes, I see that. Anybody else? Thank you, I see that, yeah. Anybody else? I want to put Jesus first in my life. Yes, 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 amen. Praise God, thank you, thank you, yeah. Yep, yep. Yeah. Anybody else? Don't miss your chance. Good. I'm going to pray for you in just a moment. And secondly, those with your head still bowed that say, hey, I, I do, I need to live differently. I realize that I've been living according to my own understanding, my own strength, and ultimately that means I've been living by my flesh. Maybe you've not been doing terrible things, but maybe you said, I, I need to be led by the Spirit more often. I need to practice letting the Spirit lead me. And I want to make a commitment to be led by the Spirit from this day forward. If that's you, you'd like to be led by the Spirit, would you raise your hand and look at me? Yes, yes. Thank you. Yes, yes. I see you. Yes. Amen. I see hands. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Led by the Spirit. Well, good. I want to practice this together as a family. And uh, there were a couple of hands that went up and said, I want to follow Jesus. So I'd like you to repeat this prayer with me, everybody in the room. And this prayer isn't magical. It's not something special, but it's a commitment that if you uh, believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth, the Lord will redeem you and forgive you. And I'd like to help you start that relationship. So if everybody in the room, whether you lifted your hand or not, if you would pray this with me, Lord Jesus, I thank you that you came, lived a spotless life, and took my place on the cross. I was living for myself, but now I want to live for you for the rest of my days. Forgive me and lead me from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You guys can look back up here. Thank you. God bless you. Yeah. Praise God. Praise God. Well, for you that raised your hand and said, I'd like to be led by the Spirit, I'm going to pray a, a closing blessing for all of us and for you. But if you did raise your hand and say, I, I'd like to be led by the Spirit a little bit more, we're going to have our prayer team come forward. And I would like to encourage you to come in agreement. We are a community. We're a family. And um, we have prayer team partners that would love to pray with you in making that commitment. God bless you. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that those that are here in this room that raised their hand and said they wanted to be led by you, Holy Spirit, I pray that you would work in them, giving them strength, giving them wisdom, and sustaining their every need so that they can follow what you're calling them to do. Lord, lead us. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would increase and that our own desires would decrease. Bless each and every one of us as we leave this place today in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.